Good morning. I'd like to read from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you are our great provision, and we thank you that we have all that we could ever ask or need in the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless him this hour, this day. We pray that you would continue to fill our hearts with the things of God in Christ, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, Bob and Jerry will bless us with special music. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Mim. Uh, much appreciated. I'd like to read from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. The Apostle Paul writes, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth 
and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Amen. Good morning, church. We're going to look at Paul's prayer in Ephesians again this week. Before we actually get into the text, I have this poster in my office that I came across years ago, and I absolutely love it. There's this kid that's building sandcastles at the seashore, and he builds one on the beach, and the picture shows a wave coming in, washing the castle away. The next picture below shows the kid building the second sandcastle higher up overlooking the beach and of where he built the first sandcastle. And there's a caption that says, be smart, learn from your mistakes. Now I can't always say that maybe I've uh, learned from my mistakes, uh, but what a spiritual lesson in that. Be smart, learn from your mistakes. mistakes. We're going to try to see if we can't splice that poster picture into uh, the, the sermon this week so you can see it. But what always struck me was the contrast between the two pictures. Uh, one where the sandcastle is getting washed away and the other one where it's high up on good solid ground. And then of course the other thing that struck me was this young kid figuring it out very, very quickly. So th this morning we're going to talk about being rooted and grounded in love, and that's a part of Paul's third uh, prayer here, or third part of Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. The first part, you'll recall, is about being strengthened in the inner person. And I remind you, as I did several weeks ago, that this is a divine work. It's not a work of man. The second part is that Christ might dwell in our hearts by faith. Now, I stressed last week that the scripture says it is impossible to please God, but a person must come to God and believe that he is. And so um, it's impossible to be a person of faith without also being strong in the faith. Faith is also a crucial ingredient to being strengthened. So in the third part of Paul's prayer here, being rooted and grounded, he uses these two images, the image of planting and the image of building. Now, one doesn't need to be a builder or a botanist to capture the essence of these images. Each image communicates strength and stability. The prayer for strength was the first part of his prayer, being strengthened in the inner person. Stability naturally follows, and we see this in the second part. We walk by faith, not by sight. Now, last week I talked about faith producing stability in contrast to being doubting or double-minded. Double-mindedness is a picture of instability, and it's the seesaw effect, the up and down part of that experience. So when Paul uses these two images of planting and building, they both embody strength and stability. They go hand in hand. Now, let's take both of these images together. You can Google architectural uh, disasters, and trust me, there are enough of them to choose from, and especially where plenty of people died because of structures failing or falling. But let's just stick with one well-known structure as an illustration, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It's still leaning, it's still compromised, although I'm not aware that anybody has died yet, thank God. Well, the Leaning Tower of Pisa was built on an unstable foundation. It was actually built on a clay bed, and they never made the foundation deep enough. Well, back in the 1990s, the authorities made the decision that they had to add 600 tons of counterweights to the base in an effort to seek to stabilize the structure for safety and tourist reasons. 
Now, who knows if what they did will be enough in the years to come to keep the tower from coming down. But it's a picture that paints a thousand words. And the images that Paul uses here also paint a thousand words or more. Both the images suggest and, and put forth the fact that you need good soil. Planting deep spiritual roots into the good soil, building on a solid and firm foundation. Good soil, so to speak. Uh, I'm reminded in Matthew's Gospel that Jesus spoke of building one's house upon the rock. Good soil, per se, uh, not upon sinking sand. And of course, the Lord Jesus was making the point that building on him is safe and smart and secure and solid, rather than building on the things of the world, which is sinking sand. Now, the Greek word for rooted means to be strengthened with roots, fixed firmly, constant. Uh, several weeks ago, I mentioned how a storm blew through the area and some trees came down. And it was those trees that had compromised and shallow root systems. The other ones that had deep anchored uh, fixed roots didn't come down. And this is a picture of strength and stability uh, when we talk about going through the storms of life. And it's strength and stability that is, is prized. Uh, there are two other thoughts that came to my mind here about being rooted. In Psalm 1, and it's a great, great psalm, but Psalm 1 sets actually the stage for reading the psalms, and it's a contrast between the righteous man and a wicked man. And the scripture tells us that a righteous man is likened to a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Well watered, it's a picture of strength and stability, and I might add a picture of fruitfulness and prosperity. But the exact opposite is true when it talks about the wicked man. There's no strength, there's no stability, there's no prosperity, there's no fruitfulness. Like chaff, they are easily blown away by the wind. The other thought I had here when it, it comes to being rooted is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, the Apostle Paul says, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. And he said this in the context of Christ building his church and giving apostles, pastors, teachers, and evangelists to the edifying of the church that we might be strengthened and find spiritual stability. And so Paul spoke about being built up in the Lord so we don't find ourselves in this spiritually unstable situation. And this was the concern that he expressed that believers find understanding in the scriptures that they're stable and they're strengthened, that they're not weak and unstable. Now, this can easily happen because false teachers mislead. Listen, you can read anything and take it out of context. You can pick and choose, especially when it comes to the Word of God. And this is what false teachers do. Uh, Jesus warned us about false teachers in the end times because they cause people to stumble and they cause the faith of many to become unstable. Now, in any discipline, there are principles, and when you come to the study of Scripture, there are principles of interpretation. And when we utilize these, script, these principles, we understand that the Scriptures are written in such a way to produce strength and stability and the assurance of eternal life. Uh, case in point, the Apostle John writes in 1 John 5, verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life and that you have it in his name. Now I want you to think about this. Every parent wants their children to, be, to grow up to be strong and stable. How much more so 
God when it comes to his children. So spiritual strength requires good spiritual soil and spiritual stability requires a firm foundation. The word for grounded in the Greek means foundational, fundamental, established to confirm. This too is a picture of strength and stability. Now I can't help but think of what Jesus said when he was going to build his church. He said that he was going to build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And in Matthew chapter 16, we find this, this passage of scripture where there's only three possible interpretations. Either Jesus is going to build the church on Peter, and I'm not too sure that that's a legitimate interpretation because Peter's a man, and men are sinful, and men fail in times of great hardship and crisis. And we see that with Peter constantly throughout the scriptures, even though he was a great saint. The other two interpretations is that Christ was going to build his church on the bedrock of Peter's confession. Peter's confession was, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. The other interpretation is, is that Christ is the rock. That is definitely also an interpretation in view here. If, if you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, Paul tells us that Christ is the rock of the Old Testament. And I also am reminded, I love that hymn uh, that says, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And how about that other great hymn? Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. So the Lord Jesus Christ is that solid rock of ages on which we build. We're to be rooted in him and we're to be grounded in him. Most of us are familiar with the term cornerstone in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. He tells us that Christ is the cornerstone. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. Also, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, the Apostle Paul mentions that Christ is foundational to the church. Now, I'm not a builder nor an architect, and, but I'm not sure that cornerstones are used today in erecting buildings because they use cement foundations. Uh, what happens is you may often see like a little block that appears to be a cornerstone with the date in which the building was built. But cornerstones, when they were used, were usually massive stones, and it was foundational to the entire structure being solid and firm. And so this is the image being put forth uh, in the building image. Now, if we go back to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, by way of illustration, again, it was lacking a firm foundation. It was lacking in good soil. It did not have the depth and the foundational firmness to be properly established. Now, these two images are put forth by the Apostle Paul in relation to becoming strong and stable in the faith. And this actually seems to fit with what Jude wrote to the church. Now, Jude was the half-brother of Jesus, but Joseph's biological son. And in Jude chapter 3, he spoke of the faith which was delivered once for all the saints. And he seems to have in mind a core body of truths, what we would call foundational and fundamental to establishing strong, stable, and faith-filled believers. Now, boy, is Satan doing a great job these days to erode these foundational truths. Being spiritually rooted and grounded here means strength and stability. It means good soil is needed. Now, let's quickly talk about the good and proper soil. In context, Paul says, being rooted and grounded in love. This, folks, is the love of Christ. 
The love of Christ in context is mentioned in verse 19. It's being rooted and grounded in Him relationally. Now, what does that mean? Well, it starts with the love of God. And Paul probably has in mind the love of Christ from a salvation point of view. In other words, believers need to have His love firmly fixed and settled in their hearts and have it fixed and settled by faith. Especially when it comes to their salvation. This is the first order being rooted and grounded in His love when it comes to their salvation, to our salvation. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 speaks to this, but God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the context of verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 3, Paul speaks about comprehending His love. And this is so, so necessary to be grounded in the love of God. Now, we're not going to look at comprehending the, the love of Christ today, which is also a portion of Paul's third part of his prayer here. But it fits nicely with this, the fourth part, which we're going to look at next week. But from a salvation standpoint, unless one settles this issue of his love in, his, in our hearts, then we'll never be strong or stable, and, 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 and stability and strength will always be elusive. One's faith will never be settled. Now, I want to give you an illustration from the heart. Growing up as a child, I never, ever, ever questioned the love that my mother had for myself and my siblings. She was the consummate mother. She was loving and giving and nurturing and caring and sacrificing. She was always there through the good, the bad, and the ugly. I knew that she loved us. I knew that she loved me. I could never say this about my biological father. He was gone when I was five. He was the consummate deadbeat dad, the antithesis of mom. When, whether you're young or whether you're old, we know when a person loves us or not. In raising my kids, my wife and I, we drew from our practical and spiritual experiences. And we made the love of Christ foundational to our home. They were raised in the love of Christ. They were taken to church. They heard the word of God and praised God by His grace, they came to faith in Him. And they came to understand that they were loved unconditionally by their parents. They knew that they were loved despite their shortcomings on their end and on our end. And they were not perfect, but they knew that they would always be forgiven and eternally forgiven. This is the kind of rooting and spiritual grounding that God wants for all of His children and that God wants to give His children. Unconditional love. Love despite being a sinner. Not perfect in and of ourselves, but perfect in Christ and eternally forgiven. The, oh, the assurance of being loved by our Heavenly Father. And Scripture lays it all out. Being rooted and grounded in the love of God is being found in His love. And it leads to living His love. And it leads to sharing His love. And we see that this structure is actually laid out in the Ten Commandments. The first four are about loving God. Five through ten are about loving our fellow man. And Jesus affirmed this structure in the greatest commandment about loving God and loving our neighbors as ourself. So being rooted and grounded relationally in the love of Christ, oh, this is how it looks like. 
And I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And so when we talk about the relational aspect of the love of God, it's having it settled in our hearts, it's loving Him, and it's loving other people. And it means forgiving and being kind, showing compassion and loving mercy, not being judgmental or being hypocritical, not being mean-spirited or harsh in our faith. And it's about loving the truth in God. Now I want to leave you with a final thought. The images here also present a picture of growth and progress in the Christian life. This is more readily communicated in the image of, the, uh, of planting because the roots grow down and they grow out and, they, and there's growth there. But growth and progress are also subtly communicated here in the building analogy. It's building on different levels of understanding and comprehension. And we're going to look at that next week. We'll talk, we'll talk about what that means. But in this building analogy, we see this with many different levels or stories or layers with physical building, buildings. The idea of building up, growing up, it's, it's progress. Some foundations are very deep. Some are very wide. Some buildings have many, many different levels, and they rise very high. It's a picture of growth and progress, strength and stability. Next week, Lord willing, we will consider what it means to comprehend the love of Christ. So let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we are, every one of us are castles in ruins, and yet by your grace, we have a chance to grow deep and to grow in the Christian life and to progress in our faith. Uh, we thank you for the scripture. Uh, we uh, continue to pray that uh, by your grace, uh, we would be all that you want us to be. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.